What the fuck? What's up, Goth Gamer Nation? It's your boy, here to talk about all the hottest new video games out there in the gamer sphere. So, here's one now. Thief! <laughs> Thief is a funny word when you put so much emphasis on it. Thief! The Dark Project is a first-person fantasy stealth game developed by Looking Glass Studios and published by Eidos Interactive in 1998 for PC. A year later, an expanded version of the game called Thief Gold would be released, and that will be the version shown in this video. It had a notoriously difficult and windy path to becoming the game it is. Starting life in 1996, when future lead designer on the Bioshock franchise, Ken Levine, would get his first job as a game designer, tasked by Looking Glass to design the concept for what would become Thief the Dark Project. After rattling off a number of more whimsical ideas like a Cold War era zombie action RPG, one that survived a few drafts, long enough for promotional material to be thrown together, was a concept called Dark Camelot, a quite literal inversion of King Arthur's legend, in which he, Merlin, and the Knights of the Round Table are villainous, tyrannical assholes, and Mordred with the help of a lesbian Guinevere, hatch a plan to steal the Holy Grail. Though their grasp on what this game's plot would entail was always tenuous, much of the game's levels and models were designed by 1997, when, after deciding that the thievery elements were the best thing the concept had going, they changed the name to The Dark Project, and began to focus their efforts more on this idea, shaping the game around this central idea of a fantasy character who doesn't run headfirst into battle and only really poses a threat in the dark. The demo and ads they would show at E3 that year reflected this philosophy. It's worth noting that 1998 was a time when the after effects of Doom's success was still on the verge of dissipating, and games in the first person were still being typecast as mindless shooters. Which, with the exception of Hexen, Prime Target, Terminator Skynet, Westworld 2000, XS, Duke Nukem 3D, Alien Trilogy, Strife Quest for the Sigil, Heretic Shadows of the Serpent Riders, Witch Haven 2 Blood Vengeance, Quake, Power Slave, Eradicator, Marathon Infinity, ZPC, Disruptor, Alien Cabal, Chex Quest 2, Damage Incorporated, Rebel Moon Rising, Blood, Outlaw, Redneck Rampage, Shadow War, Turok Dinosaur Hunter, Tanka, Hexen 2, Chasm the Rift, Quake 2, Unreal, Blood 2, The Chosen, is greatly exaggerated. You guys wanna play Doom? There were exceptions, of course, and games that attempted to break the mold, but they are far less amusing to list, unfortunately. Thief was set for a release in 97, but its development struggled that year for a number of reasons. Around the time Looking Glass was moving full steam ahead with The Dark Project, they had also chosen to self-publish a golf game called British Open Championship Golf, which was a commercial failure and created substantial loss for Looking Glass. Its failure may have had something to do with with crucial staff being shuffled around to work on Thief. Or it might just be because it's a golf game and who gives a shit. In any case, following this disaster, Looking Glass decided not to self-publish games anymore. It was also decided that they would close their studio in Austin, laying off a number of employees, many of which played critical roles in getting the Dark Project this far. And Ken Levine would go off to form Irrational Games. At this point, morale was getting kind of low at Looking Glass. With Eidos breathing down their necks knowing they wouldn't make their ship date, several more employees left from stress and paranoia. This created a number of setbacks for the crew that stuck with Thief, because they were left with code that they didn't create, or understand, or really know how much would ultimately be salvageable. While trying to regain equilibrium with an almost entirely different staff than the one that started, Looking Glass had to appease Eidos by making an appearance at E3. In mid-98, this mostly new team would strip away a lot of the excess ideas from the game's plans, like its multiplayer component, a complex inventory management system, and missions with branching paths. Taking a page from Vampire the Masquerade, the game would finally be renamed Thief the Dark Project. It wouldn't be until a few months before release that the Looking Glass team would truly start to believe in the game. Its aspirations seemed so ethereal and conceptual for a long time, but now they had something like a finished game. It's got legs now. Long, scary gameplay legs with pointy heels made of atmosphere that will just crush the shit out of your dick. So after two and a 
half years in development and consuming some three million dollars, Thief sold very well and was critically lauded and by all means should have set Looking Glass back on track, but its success couldn't quite repair the debt they had put themselves into during its development cycle. And to add to that, System Shock 2, a joint effort between Looking Glass, Irrational, and EA, would come out a few months later to mediocre sales. That still might have kept them afloat if it weren't for them also sinking considerable time and money into two flight simulator games, Flight Unlimited 3 and Jane's Attack Squadron, which they again divided the staff to accomplish. The latter was never completed, and the former was a failure that undid what gain they had from System Shock 2. The Flight Unlimited team would express frustration that Looking Glass at large only cared about Thief and that EA didn't have any faith in the project succeeding, so did little to advertise it. In any case, Looking Glass dissolved in 2000. Unlike a lot of games I elect to talk about, Thief is a massively successful and well-known at one point in time game that you're sure to find on a number of lists and countdowns for greatest or most influential games of all time, which is fair. I know you're probably here for some offbeat gags and wry observations, I'm assuming, or you're here because you can't get enough of my sad, sleepy bird voice. I'm not gonna pretend like Thief isn't a landmark. It's a first. It introduced to the concept of a 3D stealth game and a number of elements to stealth gameplay that you're likely to see to this day. Quickly influencing franchises like Splinter Cell and Hitman, it couldn't even be confined by the conventions of traditional game box geometry. It saw a row of squares and thought, F you dad, I'm gonna be a trapezoid. I'm gonna stand out from the crowd. I'm gonna be real hard to track down 20 years later when a fledgling YouTuber wants to make a video about me, and I'll cost an amount of money that is just out of his comfort zone. But anyway, this was a real experience for me. I had not played the original Thief game, which uh, I still haven't because this is a patched version of its re-release, but really, is either subtitle necessary? Why can't we just name games what they are? A single word, game. If you do another one, it's game two. If you do a prequel, it's game. One of the most interesting results of Thief's contentious origins is its setting, landing in some odd, uncharted, and whimsical crossing of medieval Europe and a dystopian, Gilliam-esque world with primitive grasps on electricity and steam power, approaching steampunk, but less clockwork and goggles and more sword and sorcery. It's a very unique place that is wholly its own thing. What details we get of this anachronistic metropolis called simply The City are found through notes, clues, and over heard conversations we find in the environment. So there is still a lot of mystery to this place, and much like the game's protagonist, we're left in the dark most of the time. <laughs> Take a trip into the unknown. There are three factions you'll come across in the world, two of which are opposing religious sects. The Hammerites, a technocratic order that worship an architect god called the Master Builder. They are a somewhat grim reflection of orthodox religion and Freemasonry, what with their zealous need to expand and progress humanity technologically and so forth. Which sounds nice, but uh, they are also obsessed with upholding their tenets and maintaining order and smashing people's heads in with big fuck-off hammers, especially if you're a pagan, the other side of the coin. I don't know if the term pagan is uh, in reference to a race in this world, or if it is an organized group, but to me it just seems like a blanket term for any manner of human or creature that has aligned themselves with the mystical forces of nature. They obviously oppose the Hammerites and how they disrespect nature by bulldozing it to build more factories and hammers. The dudes like hammers, I don't know. The pagans worship a god of nature and chaos named the Trickster, or the Woodsy Lord, if you want to borrow their pseudo-archaic parlance. You, does I? <laughs> Aside from guards and the city watch, the other faction is the Keepers, an ancient and secretive society with clandestine motives and a vague, omnipotent vibe. You get the impression that they are an Illuminati of sorts, pulling the strings of world events while remaining all but invisible to it. We learn very little about them and how they operate in The First Thief. The prologue introduces us to Garrett, who, as a young street urchin, attempted to pick the pockets of a Keeper, which is no easy feat considering most people can't even see them. Impressed by his ability, the Keeper offers to take Garrett in and show him the ways of the Keepers. He reluctantly agrees, however once he is trained to be a Keeper and knows all 
all the secret techniques to conceal yourself and infiltrate places, he leaves to pursue a life of crime. I mean, once you essentially have superpowers, what, what are you just gonna use them to scribble in locked books and steal children off the streets? No, you're gonna get out there and you're gonna steal someone's baubles. Maybe take someone's underwear, not for any weird reason, like it's just it's just that it's somebody else's, like it's a stranger's and that's exciting in a way, I've not really fully worked out. So Garrett is good at what he does. Not only did he already have an aptitude for thievery, he has training and knowledge collected from years of living with cosmic ninja monks. Because of this, he's built a bit of a reputation, and thievery in the city is not typically an independent operation. So several gangs and crime rings are pressuring him to join them because otherwise he is out there acting as a wild card, stealing shit they want and not giving them a cut of the profits. One in particular, a crime lord named Ramirez, is so incensed by his refusal to be put on a leash that he hires assassins to kill Garrett. The assassins accidentally kill a merchant, assuming him to be Garrett, and in retaliation he robs Ramirez's mansion. This brazen act of thievery impresses a mysterious woman named Victoria, who comes to Garrett with a job opportunity, representing an anonymous client. The contract is to steal a magical sword belonging to an eccentric collector named Constantine. Nobody really knows anything about this guy except that he's new in town, and his elaborate and bizarre home was recently built and impossible to map out. The longer you spend inside the mansion, the more you understand these rumors as it becomes increasingly surreal and nonsensical the further you ascend its levels, until it's an incomprehensible Alice in Wonderland nightmare. Despite the curious nature of the building and its myriad defenses, the heist goes off well. Garrett retrieves the sword and hands it over to Victoria, who reveals the client you've been employed by was Constantine. He had Garrett rob his own home as a test for an even greater heist with an even greater reward. This is nearing the halfway point in Thief's plot, so if you want to experience the story for yourself, you can skip to this time. If you'd rather have it described to you so you can uh, feign familiarity with it in social situations, online or otherwise, then uh, feel free to stick around. I have like the opposite problem. It's like something in me instinctively doesn't want to shut someone down or deny them the opportunity to talk about something they enjoy. Like they ask, are you familiar with X or do you play Y? And even if I did and uh, could continue and hold a conversation based on mutual knowledge of said topic, I say, nah, what's that? And then I just smile while they explain it, content that they have this moment and internally disappointed in myself. I'm just stalling to give you some time to decide if you want to stick around. I don't really have uh, anything prepared to talk about, so, uh... What's going on in the news? Here's something. You guys hear about this? <laughs> Apparently, I don't, I don't know. I thought if I ramped up to a late-night monologue joke, it would just come to me and, uh... It didn't. Constantine offers Garrett enough money to retire from thievery altogether in exchange for a large gemstone called the Eye that has been trapped within an abandoned Hamrite cathedral. The cathedral is located in an area of the city that was destroyed and left vacant following a catastrophe that not even Garrett seems to know anything about. It's a creepy, dilapidated area that has us avoiding zombies and ghosts and other creatures. The cathedral appears to be pretty impenetrable save for a small opening that reveals the eye hovering just out of reach. The gemstone itself seems to speak to Garrett telepathically and tells him that the only way he can make it inside is by collecting four elemental talismans that are located in different places around the city. From writings we find in the area, we pick up on some vague tidbits about how the cathedral was sealed by the keepers in order to prevent the pagan trickster god from further destroying the city. They saw this as an Avengers level threat and intervened in time, then hid the talismans in various locations. This is one of the bigger deviations between the Dark Project and Gold. In the former, two are hidden in the runes and two are hidden at a different fully operational Hammerite Cathedral. In the latter, they pull Garrett to four different locations entirely. The Lost City, the Hammerites, a Mage's Tower, and an Opera House. With all four talismans, Garrett returns to the cathedral and unseals it. Inside, the original Hammerite inhabitants were killed and turned into undead soldiers by the very thing we are here to steal. Now I know what you're thinking, it's been red flag after red flag, and Garrett perhaps should have stopped to wonder why he was stealing a sentient gemstone that turned an army undead and was so feared that it was sealed into a building with four magical keys that were in turn buried in four different locations, but at the same time, Garrett's just trying to make that bread, and I got nothing but respect for that. Seems like so far his life of thievery hasn't amounted to much, but uh, you know, all we need is one big score. That's what life's about, baby.
He returns to Victoria with the eye. Constantine activates his trap card and reveals that he has been the trickster himself! The woodsy man! The whole time. We's been trickseed like a bunch of sneaksy man fools. As if this wasn't awkward enough, Victoria says in order for the eye's power to be activated, they need a human eye. And they promptly tear out one of Garrett's, leaving him bleeding out and covered in shitty, shitty vines. Two keepers show up and free Garrett from his restraints. It's clear that despite being spurned by him, the keepers have continued to watch over and guide Garrett as he meddles in the affairs of the factions. We escape from the trickster's mansion, all the while picking up clues as to his motivations and plans. Angry at the Hammerites and humanity at large's fixation with progress, how they encroach on what was once their dominion in order to erect their ugly brick buildings and cobblestone streets, the trickster plans to use the eye to undo all their progress, bring them back to square one, a plan he refers to as his jar 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 Which could, could there be a more apt description? This project is dark. Coping with the loss of his eye well enough, he seeks out the Hammerites for help. Despite having robbed them, he figures they'd be game to fight the trickster as he's all they fucking talk about. Every day it's trickster this and thine enemy that. I'm sick of it. Oh, they're all dead. He got him. He got there before we did and they're all dead. Everybody's dead. Well, luckily beneath the temple, a group of Hammerites have holed up and are fending off the pagan forces. These survivors have devised a cunning plan, perhaps in preparation for just this exact set of circumstances, and give Garrett a dummy eye. If Garrett is able to swap it with the real eye, then the trickster will unwittingly kill himself by trying to use its power. Sounds like a job for a dirty, filthy sneak thief. A real criminal, a real piece of sh**. Garrett makes his way through the trickster's lair, which is teeming with all manner of the bizarre creatures that make up the pagan forces, at the heart of which is the trickster performing whatever ritual that does whatever that is bad that we don't want him to do. So the eye gets switched with the decoy and the trickster is killed. We cut to some time later, Garrett walks down the street and a keeper catches up to him. They exchange some words and Garrett flashes his pretty new mechanical eye. That is possible and he has now. Uh, despite his claims that he's out of the game and wants nothing to do with the keepers, this guy leaves him with a cryptic warning that there will come a time soon that Garrett will- that there will come a time soon that Garrett will have- that Garrett- fuck <laughs> this fucking sound. that there will come a time soon that Garrett will have great need of the keepers. The trickster is dead. Beware the dawn of Thief 2 the Metal Age coming soon from Eidos Interactive to a circuit city near you. Okay, that's it for spoilers. What a wild ride. Those pirates came out of nowhere, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Deceit. The first entry in the Thief franchise tells a pretty unremarkable story when you lay it all out in front of you, but what makes it, or made it special, was that it was not commonplace for a story to be told mostly through environments. You get cutscenes that act as briefings, but Garrett is like laser focused on the task at hand, and not so much with the wider implications of things. The details of the world and its history. We put that together on our own. All Garrett cares about is gold and whacking fuckers in the head. So while that's happening, the story is subtly weaving around you, it accomplishes something that a lot of fantasy games continuously fail at, which is to tell a story about a character in a big, epic, interesting world, but keep the story about that character. The bigger picture stuff is happening, but we are here for Garrett. We care about him. It doesn't use this setting to tell a story about a kingdom full of faceless red shirts we don't give a fuck about. It's a small scale film noir story. We have a guy of questionable moral standing who is easy to understand. He's a lowlife that dwells in the seedy underbelly of a city. He meets an alluring stranger that offers him a job that turns out to be much more than he bargained for. He's a very smug, streetwise, roguish type, which really contrasts with the other characters and factions. The rest of the world carries itself in this stuffy, overly serious, pseudo-Shakespearean way, and Garrett's just a fucking dude, trying to make a buck the only way he knows how. It's simple, but I have a fondness for small stories in big worlds. Yeah, there's only really one other character that has a, a memorable personality, and it's this opera singer who lives in the sewers beneath an opera house. Now, I live here under the opera, but I go back 
Stealing food and such as I need. She can't kick me out, not Raoul. <laughs> I kind of wish there could have been more fun things like that, but it does make Garrett shine. There's a modern, relatable quality to him that makes him a fun vessel into this setting and the surprisingly wacky directions it goes. For what could be a very simple premise, Thief revels in weird. And I like just how little of it we get to really see and understand. It kept me surprised and engaged because I didn't really know what it was capable of. Like, I barely have a reference for what sort of things could happen in this world. More so than the events, the experience of the story is enjoyable. I think a modern game might include an exposition character that talks to you on a radio or a character whose audio journals you find. And that can work sometimes, but I was charmed by how Thief keeps you at a distance from its own mythology, throwing you breadcrumbs and laughing at you like you're handcuffed to a radiator in my uh, shady hotel. That doesn't make it better. At its release, critics and even the game's marketing celebrated Thief being branded an anti-shooter. You couldn't put it in a category. It was unput in a boxable. You couldn't fit it in a box. Certainly not a rectangular one. You could try, but it, it would sneak away and bonk you on the nog. I don't know what that is. Did, did you hear that? Um, it's often credited with birthing a genre, which is to some degree true. Games like Castle Wolfenstein and Metal Gear introduced the idea of hiding from enemies instead of destroying them, but it would be more fair to say that games like Thief and Metal Gear Solid are probably responsible for popularizing those elements in mainstream games. Weirdly enough, a lot of the theory behind Thief's stealth gameplay actually came from early submarine games and a flight simulator called F-117 Stealth Fighter. Those games games had stealth elements that were intriguing because they were less passive than waiting for a patrolling guard to pass. You were actively working to remain unseen. Ken Levine often brings up this idea of active stealth in interviews. It's an interesting well to tap in for this game, because you don't look at it and think, oh that's like that submarine game. Wait, he, he looks nothing like a submarine. Uh, it's crazy. Thief takes place over the course of 13 or so missions that vary depending on which version you're playing. Each mission begins with a briefing where you get a rundown of your objectives, and these will differ based on the difficulty you've chosen. Normal difficulty will usually have a base requirement of get the thing you're here to get, also pick up X number of miscellaneous valuables. The harder difficulty will usually require that you don't kill anyone and that you have to escape the level when you've accomplished your objectives. In normal, it just kind of cuts to mission complete when you've done all the things you need to do. Garrett is not an unstoppable killing machine. He is a vulnerable human that in either difficulty is not meant to tackle missions aggressively or confrontationally. You want to remain unseen and unheard for as long as you can. This means keeping a close eye on your light gem, which indicates how visible you are. You also need to be listening. Few games before, or since really, have made sound this vital to gameplay. You need to be listening to the guard's activity to keep track of them mentally, as you don't have a mini-map or x-ray vision. You're only in control of things you could conceivably know about. The different surfaces you sneak across produce different levels of noise, so walking on cobblestone or metal grating will make your footsteps clank loudly, drawing attention. Carpeting and rugs will Will reduce just about all noise, leading to tense moments where you risk revealing yourself to advance further by emerging from the dark to hop to different pieces of carpeting. The gameplay is designed very cleverly to demonstrate what you need to do to remain safe and gain the advantage over enemies, and then consistently keeps it from you so you never really reach a place of comfort for too long. It becomes a back and forth of risk, relief, risk, relief. There are a number of tools that can mitigate some disadvantages in your environment, and for most of the game these are are given to you sparingly. The most interesting being the variety of specialty arrows. Water arrows fire an elemental water crystal that can extinguish torches or bonfires to give you more darkness to move around in. Fire arrows are essentially magic missiles that are mainly used to defeat the undead, as in any other context it's far from discreet. Moss arrows can be shot at the ground to dampen your footsteps. Gas arrows can knock out enemies in one hit from a distance provided you catch them off guard. Noisemaker arrows are pretty self-explanatory, they make a noise, causing most enemies to leave their post and investigate. Rope arrows are, I think, conceptually the most fun. You don't get to use them as often as I like, and uh, the physics behind them can be kind of rough, but the ability to drop a climbable rope from wooden surfaces adds a layer of freedom that I can still appreciate, when it works properly. One of my least favorite areas in this game is the Lost City, mostly because I spent a good hour just trying to use the rope to get up to the top of this building, but like, no matter what I did, I could not get Garrett to just climb up 
this ledge. The action would activate, but he'd just toss himself away from the rope. I did this for a while, until I eventually figured, well, maybe this isn't where I'm supposed to go, leading me to look up a walkthrough, and uh, I did in fact need to go up there. So I just kept at it some more, trying different variations and placements of the arrow. This trial and error went on so long that I just stopped recording, so I honestly couldn't even tell you how I eventually got up there. I don't have footage to play back because my hard drive was full of me flying off this fucking rope like Dick Grayson's family. Anyway, other than the arrows, you also have holy water that you can dip arrows in to make the undead explode. You got some flashbangs and mines and other items that I didn't really find use for. Collecting non-essential gold and trinkets gives you money that you can spend before missions on items. Your sword is your first option, but if you're reaching for it, odds are you fucked up because ideally you shouldn't have to use your sword or kill anybody for the entirety of the game. Though I admit in moments of frustration, I just wanted someone dead. I didn't really care who it was. I, I just wanted to feel powerful just for a second just for a second your blackjack allows you to knock out enemies and carry them off to secluded areas and you're gonna want to get good at that finding the sweet spot to just knock these pricks out in one hit it feels really good sometimes i feel like i understand how the hitbox worked and then sometimes <laughs> Builder, help me! Eh. While other times I'd carelessly swing at their face while I was right in front of them, and it would work just fine. So there's something, uh, there's something kind of mystical about that. I don't know how that works. The mechanics of everything feels good. I like sneaking around and taking out guards and using the tools, but every once in a while some kind of baffling glitch would happen, leading to an exceedingly unfair death. Garrett can lean left and right to peek around corners, and this works fine provided you don't lean into certain objects, as they can sometimes cause damage to you and throw you across the room. During the mission where Garrett disguises himself as a Hammerite novice in order to rob them, you have to avoid rousing suspicion in patrolling Hammerite guards, and you can't let them catch you entering restricted areas. But no matter what, one specific guard always went after me, and he was the only one. Everyone else passed by me without a glance, but this dude would seek me out. The enemy AI is already pretty smart for how new a concept this was. They investigate noises and patrol around and alert other guards if they find bodies, but this guy saw into my eyes and recognized the desperation, the aimless hunger inside. Look, I'm gonna be straight with you. I had a lot of trouble playing this game. It wasn't until the last two missions or so that I finally felt like I understood the way it works. I mean, it just seemed like... Uh, now I'm hearing things again. Anyway, uh, Thief's level design might just be something that specifically works against my inherently terrible sense of direction, but I got absolutely lost and turned around on just about every mission in this game. You are given an intentionally vague map with general landmarks and guesses as to where things might be, but once you're far off course, it's hard to make that useful again. Almost every mission ended with me running back and forth through empty halls of buildings or caves because I had dispatched every enemy, collected every unessential valuable, yet still didn't know how to conclude the objective. Sometimes I feel like this was my fault, other times I think they go a little overboard with how unintuitive and maze-like the environments can be. Some areas, I, ha I have no idea how I was supposed to guess what was expected of me. Again, in the Lost City area, which is, is just not the best level in the game. After I miraculously ended up on that building, I'm supposed to pull off this absurdly specific leap of faith. That seems impossible. You try to take a running jump across it, you're, no you're not going to get even close. But this is where you're supposed to go. This is what you're supposed to do. So just so you know, you have to take a running jump to the side and just before, jump a second time right at the edge. It's not going to feel correct. It's going to feel like you're doing some kind of cheat to bypass a part of the game. Nothing else in this game requires this of you. It's just a blend 
blemish on a pretty interesting assortment of levels. The labyrinthine castles and mansions are probably what the game does best, and once we start heading underground, environments tend to look really repetitive to the point of confusion. Like I just fucking sucked at figuring out where to go. I could, f I could feel it start to creep in every time. I'm doing good, I'm knocking dudes out, I'm collecting their keys, getting into secret passages, and then it's just like, uh oh, I've been here before. Have I tried this door? Yes, I have. What if I retrace my steps and look for something I missed? Cut to it's been 30 minutes and I just stopped filling my hard drive with my own embarrassment. <laughs> There are also two horror levels that have you fighting supernatural enemies, which I did enjoy. They are both kinda the biggest wrench that gets thrown into the gameplay loop, because you often can't hide from them, you often should kill them, and you often can't do so with conventional means. I mean, if you're good at the game, you can get through this the same way you've been doing it, sneaking around and hitting things in the back. Some people just aren't cut out for this sort of thing. And uh, maybe those people are realizing that. They're also just really unsettling, especially when you don't have the means to kill any more of them. So you have to start keeping track of where they are and strategizing how you're gonna sprint past them to keep running errands for this nice, tolerant ghost man. One of the most solid scares they've had in years came at the hands of an enemy that was added in Thief Gold purely as a means to avoid reaching an unwinnable state. If you ran out of fire arrows, they produce fire arrows. Yo, you good? And, uh, I don't think this guy did. Ah! Did I hit everything I wanted to say about gameplay? Uh, well, I'd like it if you didn't immediately equip an item you just picked up. That's obnoxious. You're probably gonna want to remap most of the controls because by default, it's set to have the A and D in WASD make you turn the direction you're facing instead of strafing, which is tantamount to a war crime. What the fuck is that? What is that? Noise? Thief wasn't really turning heads in 98, and it sure isn't now. I can still see the charm in its blocky character models that all look like they're moving underwater and its muddy, grimy looking textures. But even with modern patches, I can see how it might be a tough sell for a new player. The thing about its visuals that still blows me away is that while this was not particularly groundbreaking to look at, the environments in Thief, unlike just about any 3D action adventure game up until then, are greatly important to gameplay. It's not just a pretty backdrop you're running through to get to the exit. You have to use the shadows and layout to your advantage. And you know what? Some of the castle interiors still look nice. The more surreal areas have some fun visuals, but I will admit that the cave areas look bland and repetitive, and even in the castles, it was very odd to enter a room and just be like, oh, so there's literally nothing in this room. There's no purpose for it. Like, not a thing. There's not an object in there. Not a single one. Not a single vague facsimile of what that room could have functioned as. It's nothing. I love the cutscenes in this game. They feel straight out of mid-90s MTV, like it should be preceded by an Aeon Flux short. It's this wonderful blending of animatic art, computer-generated effects, and live action. That intro alone is like exactly how you win me over. <laughs> Unique animation, various texts and runes flashing on the screen, a soundtrack that is just shy of industrial, and a weird choir of murmuring voices. All the music is really great. There's a very brief theme that has stayed lodged in my brain since, and it's this wonderful, discomforting music cue that plays when Victoria is introduced. It's like a pipe organ or a calliope or something that is played on top of another track being reversed. It's very striking, like this slow, slipping mask of innocence that hides something otherworldly. I like those things. It's good. It's uh it's it's all very brief though. All the music appears in these like painfully brief snippets that I, I want to hear more of, but there isn't. It's hard for me to be patient and have some opinion on the game visually, you know, past some of the more charming visuals and areas, and the cutscenes are cool, because what really stands out the most in this game, beyond any aspect of it, is the way it sounds. The way it penetrates your ears. That's unnecessary, I didn't need to say that. A ton of attention and care was put into the sound design. And with good reason, because sound is a part of gameplay. So not only is there this wonderful, original, and thick atmosphere What's happening there? Partners fight, it's 
never good. I heard that. We got Donald on the south side and Ruben on the north. It's important that you consistently pay attention to it. The sound design in general is great and shines in areas with lots of mechanical and metallic business going on. All the clanking and rustling of chains and pouring of steam all sound great. The sound of you successfully clubbing someone in the head or getting a good shot with a gas arrow continued to be satisfying until the end. Speaking of satisfying, some of the noises Garrett makes like when he takes fall damage sounds like he's having a really satisfying time. The ghostly enemies emit this amusing din made of voices pitched up and down and reversed and reverberated. Some creatures make noises that, while very original and well done, are deeply unpleasant and unnerving and I had such a strong reaction to them that I did everything I could to avoid them happening. This mostly came from the pagan enemies that straddle this fine line between absolutely goofy and deeply upsetting. The way they awkwardly march around like an alien that thinks it's a human or an insect that was just turned bipedal and is trying to figure out how to function. I don't like it. I don't like crawlies and I don't like the idea of a crawly walking around like it's a person. I will step on all of you, I will crush your family, and your friends, and guess what buddy, I'm gonna crush you last. I love listening to all the silly interactions you can overhear from the guards, how everyone is just a gossipy bitch. Do you want to argue with the lords? Now what's the password? Hand of shadow, foot of air. Open the door, okay? Well, now he hasn't given me the password. Are you taffing me? And then the Hamrites will have these intense exchanges about executing people or punishing heretics, and then immediately cut to the sound that plays when they are passively patrolling an area, which is a jaunty whistle. Our strength and resolve, it is not what it once was. And see what our weakness hath gained us. Crime and sin reach to the very heights of the city. Voice acting across the board is pretty great, and mostly over the top and cartoony with the exception of Garrett, voiced by Steven Russell who played a number of characters in Skyrim and more recently the protagonist in Dishonored 2. He has a fantastic voice that breathes a lot of character into Garrett and by extension the game since he is the most consistent presence in it. I have a simple job planned for this evening. Break into a guarded mansion, steal another fat nobleman's priceless trinket and leave quietly. He's got a cynical, dry wit to him, thinks himself better than most folk in this world, and it makes for an interesting character. Someone who has no real intention of doing good, but is sort of manipulated into compliance with those that do want to do good. And he'll do it, but he's gonna bitch and moan the whole time. I like hearing him interject to relatively trivial bits of gameplay. Let's not try that again. It's oddly comforting after wandering around a maze for 30 minutes to hear him say something and just remember, right? I mean, it's you and me, buddy. We're just a couple of... What the fuck? I... I, I know it's nothing. I know I'm getting myself worked up over nothing. It's nothing. I thought this game was about sneaking into houses and stealing things, not navigating maze-like dungeons and dealing with ghosts and zombies. The Twisted Up Mansion was cool though. By the way, the fanbase is a total cult that thinks this is the best stealth game on earth and cannot tolerate anybody that doesn't fawn over it. Steer clear. Go buy Thief 2 instead. Why did she think that? What part of the promotional material or screenshots made it seem like the main activity you'd be taking part in is stealing from homes? I mean, I understand the desire for some kind of B&E simulator, but look at this. Did you think that's what this would be? Come on, guy. Come on. I don't know why you'd say that about the fan base. Maybe you had some experience that I can never know, but I'd guess if you go around being a contrarian because you don't like other people enjoying something a lot, so you call them a cult, it's going to incite some passionate repartee. It's a thief game with almost no theft you're gonna spend most of the time killing zombies and some raptor-like creatures rather than stealing and sneaking around. The only good thing about this game is that you can bunny hop through it. Can't do this in other Thief games. Most of the time, you mean two missions where you are given the option to kill zombies and raptor-like creatures? You don't have to kill them and frankly, if you can stomach the horrendous noise they make as you're killing them, then you're a monster. You got bigger things to worry about. Without remapping the controls, this is unplayable. Half of my playtime is literally me trying to figure out how to fix this arcade control scheme. Okay, like, not to be an asshole, but why did that take you so long? 
It took me all of two minutes to figure out how I wanted to control the game. And this is standard for most PC games regardless of age. I mean, is that not one of the great things about PC gaming? The freedom. Also, half your playtime? What would that be, 15 minutes? Get out of here. Get out of here! It's amazing what people will think is fun just because of nostalgia. Well, I'd like to think this whole video I just did is testament to the inaccuracy of that observation. I had never played this game, and I enjoyed my experience, so go fuck yourself. <laughs> Way too old to be fun on modern systems. But I just played it, and I had fun. Are you, are you trying to deny me my fleeting moment of joy to invalidate it? It's real, it happened. Cannot change weapons. The player manual says to use tab, but all that does is bring up the compass. Stay away from this one. Sweaty, you change the weapons with the number keys. You're welcome. Important note, this is not a stealth game. It's more of a Tomb Raider dungeon crawling horror with fantasy elements. If you can somehow suffer through autistic level design that reminds me of Minecraft caves, then you might enjoy this game. The sound is great and horror atmosphere can be enjoyable at times, otherwise get Thief 2, it's better in every way. Uh, more important note from someone who doesn't describe things as autistic, it in every sense of the word is a stealth game. Every aspect of its design is in service to stealth gameplay. So you're dumb. You're a dummy. You're, you're a dumb person. Thief remains a charming and challenging stealth game that despite its age feels so dislodged from time. You can feel its confidence and its rebellious spirit. It's so clearly something that was the result of genre fatigue, and there are little bits of gameplay and physics that are commonplace now, but you don't expect to see dabbled with so early. The world and story presented is still some of the most creative ideas I've seen done with fantasy. It doesn't seem like it's trying to play into some established work. It just wants castles and traditional shit. And and fuck it, a robotic eye, and cults, and secret societies, and rat people. It's just fun. I wish I could see more beyond video games, even. To be fair, Dark Horse would eventually put out a Thief comic, but it would be a tie-in with the game's poorly received reboot in 2014. This was also one of the most frustrating experiences I've had with a game, but I count that as a mark of quality, because when I'm truly not enjoying a game, I stop playing it. We live in a society... <laughs> Endless, unchanging, without ambition. <laughs> yeah. Don't we though? We do live in one. Where all the games are at our fingertips, while well, the ones that people have cared to preserve. So I see no reason to continue playing something that I know I'm not gonna enjoy. Every second of my frustration with Thief was only because I wanted to keep going, I wanted to see more, and I was being kept from that either because of my own incompetence or it was one of the game's more unintuitive choices. It's far from perfect, and it gets progressively more niche and impenetrable as it ages. But by the end, I mostly remembered the fun parts, the tension, waiting to get a drop on guards, assessing the risk of dashing out into the light for a moment, you do have to invest some time into installing patches and fixes and mods if you choose to. You have a lot of options on ways to change or improve the game depending on your preferences. For sure, at least use the latest T-Fix because that gets the cutscenes working again, and that's a big part of what I liked about it. Try not to think of the significance that Thief holds historically to video games, and look at it as just a game that you could play right now. And honestly, I think it holds up with some alteration like fixing the key binding and resolution, but as long as you went into it knowing it's difficult and it's archaic in ways, but ultimately solid, like the mechanics of this game are still great if you understand them, and then it's, it's still it's still worth checking out. And I sort of wish I could go back and play the first half and not be a complete idiot about getting lost and confused about objectives, but also I'm not someone that has an aversion to walkthroughs. I'd use a walkthrough for my entire life if I could. You kidding me? How long should I hide in this person's house? Skip ahead, says here they find me. So maybe I should just pick a different house. The soundtrack is a delightful mix of creepy ambience and what I can only describe as goth heist music. It's, it's all great. Everything sounds great. You should play it. Uh, if, if you want to. No, I should have committed to that. Special thanks to Whoa, Ailing Uncle, <laughs> Resurrection, Game Master, Bayard Brown. This deal is getting worse all the time. Nazim Kamal Ure, Mr. Benjamin, News Time, Karen Mavel, Dark Raptor 86, Charles Marr, Oisto, Alexander Sundin, Octo, Dylan Sorum, Alexander Smith, Joseph Zanoni, Nylanthrope, and Daniel Person for donating at the highest tier on my Patreon. That's more names than there were before. That's crazy. Thank you so much for your support and your help and your emotional support. Just the fact that your name's there. That means somebody wants to see the things I make. I just want you to know how much it means to me. It's amazing. All of you. This is amazing. We're gonna keep this going though. At least until I'm dead. So that's like a guaranteed three, four months.
Hm. 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 